give blood. All right, 25 minutes before 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. You ladies have not always been treated too well, Robin. And in this country, we have done a lot to make sure that that's not true anymore. Um, sometimes, you know, we don't realize that other countries are, aren't quite up to where we even are. And but, but they're making progress, I suppose. I hope, anyway. My hope is that they are. You always hear these crazy stories of how women are treated or minorities are treated or people are treated just because of uh, their gender or their race. Uh, Roseanne Lake has written a book called Leftover China. The Leftover women, in China. Leftover sorry. in China. I I'm had sorry. a typo. The Women Shaping the World's Next Superpower. Well, I actually see the title on the on the podcast, so I made a mistake there. Uh, Roseanne is the correspondent for The Economist's Cuba. She worked for five years in Beijing, China, as a TV reporter and a journalist. She's a contributor to foreign policy, Time, Atlantic, Salon, Vice. She goes on and on and on. And uh, her new book, Leftover China, is actually number one right now um, on Amazon. Let me let me find. I had a couple of different uh, accolades here. Number one in Asian, let me see, Asian books, I think. Uh, Asian history, number one in Asian history. Number, it's so hard to scroll this stupid thing. All right, number, where is it? Number 11 in uh, Asian history. History also. Oh, that's in the textbook category. Number twenty-six in gender studies, and number thirty-seven in China. That's that's pretty good to be yep. on the chart that many times. Leftover in China. Leftover in China. Good morning, Roseanne. Thank you for being on the show with us today. Good morning, Larry. Thank you for having me. So, what is it like for? Let me ask you this two ways. Um, if you can answer both ways, what is it like for you when you're in China as a visitor? And I mean, you live there five years, so that's. You almost passed the visitor status, or you did pass the visitor status. But what what is it like for you as somebody who wasn't born there, I guess, is what I want to say. And what is it like for the women who were born there? What is life like? Well, when you say I passed the visitor status, I'd like to think that at heart I'm just an old Beijing resident, a Lao Beijing resident. And then a lot of people kind of tease me and say that I am um, because it's really a place that I, I, I felt really at home there. Um, it was a great place to live. And one of the most exciting things about it was, yeah, it was, I mean, the, the genesis of this book came from the women that I describe in it, right? These protagonists, these women who are left over if they're not married by age 27. And they were great sources for me and, and our conversation were essentially an exchange because we were, I mean, they were 23 and 24 when I met them. We were all the same age. And um, instead of me just being the journalist that asks them questions like, why is it like this? Why are you left over? It was an exchange. I mean, I had no intention of writing a book when I got there. It was really just, you know, these conversations that kept coming up at work. Um, I was working at a television station and the first women I met who were left over were my colleagues. Um, and it was just an exchange. They would ask, what's life like? in the U.S. Is New York really like sex in the city? They were curious. They wanted to know. And so it started off as an exchange and being a foreigner, I think it was a bit easier for them to talk to me about such personal issues as, you know, the right, idea like right. dating and because these are things that, you know, China is a collectivist culture and you don't air too much dirty laundry. So if you're fielding a lot of pressure from your family, it's not something you're maybe going to talk about with your friends. But if your friend is foreign and comes from a different context, it's a little bit easier. So so it, it seems like it was cathartic for some of them to speak with me. And, of course, there was an exchange. They could see how things were in other places. Um, and being a foreigner, I think, actually worked to my advantage. And, of course, when you do something silly, um, you can always say, oh, well, I'm a foreigner. What do I know? And you can kind of just yeah, pass yeah, it off yeah, that yeah, way as yeah. well. That's mm-hmm. helpful. But uh, education wasn't lost on the uh, uh, girls in China if the families didn't have the sons they were hoping for. They at least made sure that the girls had a super education. Exactly. I mean, that's a big part of this story, and that's what makes this generation so different um, from the ones before it, right? So when the one-child policy starts in 1979, you start seeing lots of baby girls are aborted or killed shortly after birth because if people can only have one child, China's traditional preference for sons indicates that they want to have a boy. Um, And that happened overwhelmingly, or, you know, it happened in, in, in high numbers in rural areas of China where parents were a bit more traditionally minded, and when they need 
needed where they needed these boys to um, look after their 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 farms on top of it. Whereas in urban areas, parents were a bit more flexible. If they got a girl, it was kind of like, all right, yeah, so we keep the girl. Really? She doesn't have a brother. Well, we're going to give her every opportunity, right? So opportunities that may have otherwise gone to these girls' brothers, if in multiple children families, just ended up going to these girls, and that distinguishes their generation because it means they got greater access to to education and opportunities than any generation of women before them. Partially because they were only daughters, but partially because they grew up during a tremendous economic boom, and also a time where China overall greatly increased the amount of GDP that it put into education. Many more universities were open, and education increased as a whole during this time. So what happens? You know, women get more educated. They have more family support, more resources. Their families are suddenly wealthy enough to send them to study abroad, so they get exposure to foreign cultures. Um, They're growing up in massive cities, right? That means that suddenly those timetables, those really traditional timetables for marriage, um, that, you know, are remnants of Confucianism, right? This idea that, you know, um, men are superior to women and marriages aren't about romantic love. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're partnerships. It's something that you go roads, you pass the days with somebody. Um, oh. You know, and, and this idea that marriage should be universal and compulsory and kind of the only way that you can exist as a man or a woman, because traditionally, you know, marriage has been very important in China. It's been a way of organizing a country so large, right? How else do you organize that many people? You have them married into little units called families that are the building blocks of your nation. Mm. And so, um, you know, that's that was an important part of it. Now, suddenly, marriage is discretionary. So, uh, women don't have to marry to survive, and, and that's changed a lot. So, okay. Roseanne, it, it sounds like life for the modern Chinese woman is is drastically different than that of her mother. I mean, even even in one generation, it seems Absolutely. like it's changed a lot. And, and so yeah. th- does that affect, is, is there a, a generation gap, I guess, because of that? There's a huge generation gap, and as one of the characters in the book puts it, it's like a generation of chickens has given birth to a generation of ducks. Um, it's really like, you know, they're on different pages. They're, uh, she described parents as sort of being the cog in the system that hasn't really budged because the economy has grown. And, you know, China, from a demographic perspective, as a result of the gender imbalance that has ensued as a result of the one-child policy, and from an economic perspective, is a very different place than it was. 30 years ago, um, but the mentality of society hasn't changed nearly as much. Oh, really? And so, you know, it, the so, culture is trying to catch up to so, uh, things that other things that have changed so quickly. In, in the book, do you uh, do you talk about or do you do you interview any uh, Chinese women who were like your counterparts? They came here, and and was the culture shock um, enlightening or was it disappointing? What was their experience? Those who were able to come here. Well, one of the main characters in the book who who studied at Yale, so she spent, and she also went to high school in the United States, um, her experience was different. I mean, she was surprised that people in high school date um, and that people in college date because all along she'd been told to focus on her studies by her parents. She's an only daughter born in Beijing. And, um, of course, you know, young Chinese students, adolescents, whatnot, they, they date, right? They're... They're, you know, they're sweet nothings exchange, and you do see people, you know, younger kids holding hands and whatnot, but it's not something you're really supposed to do. Um, teachers discourage it. Parents certainly discourage it. And so she kind of got to college, and of course, you know, <laughs> they're dorms, right? And then mm-hmm. the sexes are living closely to one another, and it's a very different thing. And she explained, like, she essentially didn't know how to date. Um, th- this was a very sort of new thing for her. And she had been very focused on her studies, and she's an excellent student and a very accomplished woman. And so there was that element of, like, well, how do I fit into this? Like, I'm, I'm kind of quiet and kind of geeky. Like, <laughs> I, I didn't know. I, I don't know how to talk to men. I, maybe I need to read some books about them. That was actually her first, um, her first response of how to deal with the situation. Like, what can I read? You know, what can I study about this? But, of course, that's not something you can really study. You need to experience it. And so her story of doing that um, is, is plays into the for, book, right? Plays into those different expectations. I'm wondering, we, uh, there's probably no way to know this, but I'm wondering if your book is so successful in part because um, transplanted Chinese women living here are, are curious to see your, your, your take on what's happening over there. I'm, I'm thinking that might be at least part of your readership. That's definitely a part of it. 
Um, and in a sense, I mean, the book, I wrote it for Chinese women. It's published with a big house, and it, it's a mainstream book, but I wrote it for them. Um, I thought it was unfair that, you know, they were being called leftover. This otherwise very promising population was given such an unsavory term, and I wanted to show that it was normal, that, you know, women getting married later in life or not at all was, was just part of, of a massive, you know, cultural shift that's been happening all over the world, right? Um, and so it is interesting for women here. Um, the situation is slightly more complicated for them because they're here and they complete their studies and um, there's always this idea of, well, do I get a job and stay or do I go back to China? The dating timelines and the expectations are very different. I mean, especially around this time of year, which is Chinese New Year, you'll have these women say to you, ah, this is great. The U.S. school year doesn't break for Chinese New Year, so I don't have to go home. I don't have to face my family. I don't have to face my relatives. I don't have to face the neighbors. I don't have to get questioned by the taxi driver. I get to skip it. And and the more I study, the more I skip it. I'm going to do a PhD. Whew, I missed out six years. You know, it's great. <laughs> but there comes a point where, you know, the studies are done and you either get a job and stay or you go home. And part of going home means being thrown back into, you know, that timeline, those expectations. And, but the, at the same time, so there's this desire to maybe want to stay and, and skip out on the, all that. But again, you know, many of these women are only daughters and they're all their parents have. So you can understand just how badly their parents want to have them nearby. Yeah, and as sure, parents get sure, older, sure. that becomes more complicated. Yeah. But then mm-hmm. again, the dating landscape for them is complicated in China because they're older than they're supposed to be to be considered marriageable. And they're also quite well educated with, you you know, in a country like China where marriage hypergamy or this idea that, you know, a woman should always marry up and a man should always marry down has been so enforced for such a long time, there aren't really enough guys to go around, despite a surplus of men, right? There aren't enough guys um, who are sort of superior than they are that they can technically marry from like a you know, so, societal perspective. Roseanne, for that to happen. Roseanne, help me understand the word leftover. You said something that made me wonder if maybe I didn't understand the word leftover. You said it was a derogatory term, and, and you were trying to point out that it's not nece- they're not necessarily leftovers. And, and so, in a way, I'm just curious, is that what they're being called? And, and did you title your book this because you're trying to show that that term is, is kind of unnecessary or improper or uh, offensive, maybe. It's the irony of it. Yeah, I'm trying to show the irony of it. I mean, of course it's offensive to call a woman left over at any age is offensive, but especially, you know, at the tender age of 27, if she's not married, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. But these women are referred to as sheng nu, uh, which translates to leftover women. And just to give you an idea of the context, the prefix sheng is the same as in sheng tai, which means leftover food. So the association really is a very unpalatable one. And, um, you know, the book is called this because it's, it's yeah, it's meant to underscore right. the, now you know, the it. absurdity of a word yeah. that requires to, uh, of a, you know, it, uh, it is a promising a, population. Of it, is, it is absurd. Is it any of our business? Uh, I mean, we want to see the whole world uh, on, an, on an equal level playing field, but I, I sometimes wonder if, if it's any of our business, is there are there what what is the political um, landscape like in China? Do are they mostly men running things, or or are women in elected offices, or do they even elect people into office? I don't even know how the the, the process might be. No, I mean, yeah. I, all, all we hear about is the at the national level. We don't hear about the mayors and and, mm-hmm. the, and the city council if there is such a thing. <laughs> No, yeah, there there are not elections. I don't know what it is about me, but I tend to specialize in cover pla- covering places where there aren't presidential elections. So you know, China first, now Cuba. There aren't real actual elections where you know the highest officials are elected by the people. Um, and you're right. I mean, it is primarily men in in charge, and it has been that way for a very long time. Um, so that doesn't help. But, I mean, I would stress that, you know, the majority of, of the stress on these women comes from their families anyway. Um, but still, I mean, there certainly are um, a majority of men in power in China. Are all men, uh, are, are all boys highly educated in China like the uh, girls are? Or are there some that they really don't go through any education process at all as they're farmers and live on the outskirts of the urban I mean, the men who were born in in, uh, rural areas 
ha- did not have the same access to education, right? They were born in, in, in rural areas and, and to for- poorer families, and they didn't benefit from China's economic growth in the same way that, um, you know, women or, me- women or men born in urban areas have. Um, and as a result of being boys, you know, they were also kind of stuck on their family farm because they, it was their job to look after their parents. So they didn't have that same mobility. I mean, if a, gr- a girl were born into this area because it's kind of expected that she, she could marry up, she may have gone and worked as a waitress or a masseuse or a hostess at a, you know, a karaoke parlor and met someone there that she could marry up into and then into a bigger family and, you know, gotten herself out of that rural area. Right. But the guys as guys were a bit more stuck. Um, and so that's mm-hmm another huge population of, of leftovers that China is contending with. They don't refer to these men, you know, these rural bachelors as, as, as leftover. They call them guanggun, which actually means bare branches. And the term is in reference to the fact that it's unlikely that they'll ever find a wife because numerically there just aren't enough to go around um, and that they'll never produce. Well, whose fault is that? Yeah, that is the fault of the government. I mean, they, they were the ones who had this. <laughs> <laughs> so were you were you kind of like a, like a breath of fresh air for them? If they're talking to you, I mean, did you kind of let them know that, hey, you know, your world isn't really that fair to you? Or were they already aware of that? Um. There were very few who understood, you know, why it was so hard for them to find guys to bring home to their parents over the holiday. Um, that was kind of the first question I asked, and they didn't really have an answer for it. So the the intricacies of this one child policy and how the gender imbalance is actually, you know, the surplus of men is very misleading because many of these guys are in, in areas where these women are going to bump into them, right? My colleagues aren't going to bump into the surplus of men because they're, you know, miles and miles away in a very different part of China. And they weren't fully aware of that. I think um, in some ways it was cathartic to be able to talk about this. And I only say it because I would start talking to one and she would say, oh, you really need to talk to my friend. And, and after a while, I was kind of like the leftover woman whisperer and more and more we <laughs> need to talk about this. Uh, which is how I got so many stories. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't. I wasn't planning on writing a book. I was a pretty fresh reporter just out of grad school. Um, the a book was the furthest thing from my mind, but it got to the point that so many of these stories were piling up, and I physically just felt heavy having them in me. It was like I needed to release them somehow. I was going all the bonkers. Like one more story of a mother who's complaining of tinnitus because she can't sleep at night because because her daughter's not married. It was just like it was getting pretty intense, mm-hmm. and the stories were colorful. And for me, it was just such a great way to understand modern. China. Like a lot of the books out there are, you know, serious books about the economy and, 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 you know, they're very well reported, serious books. And, um, as someone who was a bit younger than those writers and, and surrounded by younger people, I kind of wanted to make sense of modern China's economy, but I wasn't, I mean, I work for the economist now, it's a bit of a different story, but I don't know. At the time I was more interested in what was going on in the lives of young people, because of course they're a big, they're an important part of China going forward. So it's uh, just a great way for me to understand a culture I wasn't familiar with. You had said earlier that uh, sometimes when the girls from China come over here, they'll extend their education and then they have to get a job. And then once they get a job, do they become U.S. citizens or are they here on an unlimited visa to work here? Oh, it really depends. I mean, getting a visa is the tricky part. If you're here for long enough and if your employer is going to sponsor a visa, um, just like, you know, a foreigner from any country, you could stay long enough to get a green card. Um, And then if you stay longer, you know, much longer than that, I guess citizenship could eventually happen. But it's definitely not something automatic. And being able to stay is hard enough. I mean, getting that visa is a costly process. It's a very, you know, paper intensive process. And it's certainly not an option for everyone and do they um like when they go home if they fall in love with an with a person who is uh not of their culture do the parents accept them or do they have to like be sure they don't fall in love with someone that's not part of their culture (laughs) this is a question that a lot of women have been asking me um i think that you know Chinese parents have an ideal for the type of person they'd like their daughter to marry or their son to marry. It works for both sexes. Um, And that ideal erodes the older that their children get and the more desperate that they become to have them married. 
So I kind of say to girls, look, if you want to marry a guy who you think your parents aren't going to be into, wait a little bit longer until they're more nervous about how old you are. And they'll be a bit more flexible in accepting a guy because they're just going to be so darn happy that you're getting married. What is cha- what is changing things? Is it social media? Is it uh, is it just? I mean, why? And, and what do you see for the future? Like, what, how do you see China in ten years from now, especially in regards to how women are treated and, and what their lives are like? Holy cow! Ten years in China is like fifty years anywhere else. I mean, that place things happen quickly. Um, one of my favorite things about you know visiting now that I no longer live there is that it's a completely cashless society. You don't use cash in China really? anymore. You use WeChat, with, which is an app that everyone has, um, and it's essentially a chatting app. So it's kind of like a cross between WhatsApp and Facebook. And I say Facebook because it's got this its own version of a wall that's called your moments and you can post things that are happening but fundamentally it's a chat app um and that app has expanded tremendously since i left china and and it expands i mean very regularly from that app you can buy your groceries book a plane ticket buy movie tickets uh book a taxi a massage it's all concentrated in one app and if you go to the store say i want to buy i'm on the street and i'm hungry i want a snack i want to buy some dumplings these dumplings aren't going to cost me more than a dollar um and the vendor is going to have a little tiny cart out on the street and it'll have a little sign usually a laminated one with a qr code and i will scan that qr code with my phone either through the wechat app or through alipay and off i go um all i do is scan there are restaurants in china with the same code on the table so don't worry about calling the waitress for a bill, this and that. No. Once you're done with the meal, you scan the code and you're off. Right? Wow. China is, wow. yeah, it's, it, these things don't really happen in too many places. So and I think in, a few people who have been to China, in, go a, ahead. in a way, it sounds like they are ahead of us in that regard. And we are ahead of them as far as, you know, treating people fairly. And we're not quite there yet. I think we still have some tweaking to do, but... It seems we like, do. <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like that's our area, and their area seems to be technology. Right. I mean, that kind of underscores what I argue in the book, right? It's, it's an economy that has soared and has taken off, and a culture that is struggling to recalibrate. That's really it. I mean, as far as technology and all of these things go, they are very advanced. But a, a cultural is, culture is something more delicate, right? You have layers and layers of older generations and right. of tradition and Confucianism on top of that, and that's a bit harder to shake. Yeah, it sure is. What an interesting conversation. Roseanne Lake, thank you for being on the show with us. Congratulations on the success. Leftover in China is the name of the book. I found it on Amazon really easily. Uh, I had the picture up there. I have your picture up there right now. Let me put the picture of the book back up there. Um, There it is, right there. Leftover in China, the women shaping the world's next superpower. Uh, Roseanne Lake, thank you for being on the show with us. Before I say goodbye, do you have a website you want to recommend? Sure, it's my personal website, uh, www.roseanlake.com. All of this stuff is on there. Uh, events, I'll be at Strand Bookstore in New York City tonight, and all the other good stuff, reviews, pictures, videos, all that stuff is up on the site. You're in New York today? Nice. I'm at, yes, uh, New York City tonight at Strand Bookstore, and tomorrow at the New York Public Library um, and the Little Alley Restaurant, and then I'm off to San Francisco. Oh, oh wow. My gosh. Oh, wow. <laughs> How fun. R- Roseanne, <laughs> thank you. Fun interview. Very informative and s- shed some light on some place that's still a mystery for me anyway. Roseanne, thank you. Thank you, and happy Year of the Dog. <laughs> Year of the Dog. I love that. All right, we'll be, we'll be right back. <laughs> Is that couch cushion sinking lower every time you sit in it? Does your boat look better with the cover on? Has your car's interior seen its better? 